Thank you. Good morning. Thanks for coming, and uh, thanks for everybody out there in the, the interland. So, um, there's a few things I want to talk about today. Again, there's a quote behind me uh, from George Washington, one of our founding fathers. Um, today's talk will be focused predominantly on veterans and and a couple of initiatives that I work with. Um, but I'll, I'll talk a little about veterans, the veteran space, and how I became connected to it. Um, a lot of things we do today, um, we have the what's and, and why we get involved in things. We're, we're educated. We go through certain training programs. Uh, when I was in the Army, uh, I was trained to do certain things. Uh, but one of the things that we don't always have is that why. Uh, and today I'm going to talk about the why and some of the reasons why I'm connected with these organizations. Uh, the quote right here is a, a great indicator. Uh, on one of the reasons why I'm involved. Um, I come from a big military family. Um, everybody in my family on the male side has served at least one tour um, dating back four generations. So all the conflicts, uh, everybody has served their part. So I did that as a young kid. Um, I was born into a military family. My dad was in the Air Force. Um, my wife is still active duty military. Uh, and our son, Nathan, is actually in the training program to be an Army Ranger. Uh, so we see it from all angles. Uh, not only am I uh, a veteran, uh, I'm a retiree, I'm a dependent, my wife is still active, and my son is in. So I, I see this from a lot of different angles as I want to support veterans, not only veterans who are out there who have served their two or three years, but I want to make sure that some of these programs are able to support initiatives. Uh, again, our son is in. My brother's retired from the Army. Um, he has three children in the Army right now. So some of these initiatives uh, have more impact uh, because of our, our family connections. Um, there's, there's three numbers up here also. Uh, so I'm going to talk. Uh, I'm not a big statistics person. I'm not going to give you a lot of numbers on here's veteran populations, here's veteran suicides, here's this. Um, but I'm going to talk about one, two, and three uh, and, and, the, and the reason why I'm talking about those. Um, the one is, uh, is less than 1% of the American population serves in the military. So there's a, there's a disconnect uh, or a, a, a lack of connection between uh, the veteran space, the veteran connected, and the bulk of society. So when you look at that, one, that less than 1%, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of folks who serve uh, but they're not connected to the majority of the population on the outside. So a lot of these programs aren't understood when veterans come home, uh, what their needs are, uh, just because of the, the big population doing, uh, doing their jobs, doing their day-to-day -day work. Um, I'm not saying that as veterans we're always looking for connection, uh, but we, we, we come out of the service and we just want to be a part of a team like we were before. So a lot of these uh, younger guys who feel misunderstood uh, they just want to be a part of an organization that was successful like they just served in. So it's, a, it's an interesting dynamic there as we build on that. Um, I, I mentioned the reason why um, a minute ago. And uh, one of the big reasons, um, three years ago I was involved with another organization on their, uh, on their board. Um, it was during sequestration when the government had shut down in Washington, D.C. because of funding issues and, and, and political issues. And there was a, a group of rangers that were involved in a firefight in Afghanistan. And the, the government, because of the shutdown, couldn't figure out how to fund uh, the funeral services for these warriors that were being brought back home. So the organization that I worked for stepped in and was able to provide funding and was reimbursed later. But again, these are the reasons why you get involved. We, we, we have a cause that we want to stand for and we look at these reasons. Uh, again, this is a reason that showed this disconnect between the military, between the veteran space and, and the government itself. Um, I'm a big believer myself in, uh, I, I, I've led troops into combat. Uh, I, I've had them wounded. I've had them killed. I think if we, if we leave a soldier, uh, if, if we bring a soldier home, I mean, uh, from a combat zone uh, and he's wounded, the government should take care of him as long as it takes for him to either return to military duty or to um, go back to his, his uh, civilian life and, and be integrated back into society. 
there shouldn't be any gaps in funding. There, the government should do that. You know, we, we, we take that young soldier into battle, uh, and the government should be responsible for him. Th that is not the case. There are, there are gaps in coverage. Uh, there are gaps in uh, the amount of funding that the military, uh, the DOD, will pay for the recovery. So that's where organizations like the ones I work for step in uh, and have the ability to fill some of those voids. Uh, I'm glad that there's a lot of patriotic Americans out there who want to make a difference, who help organizations like ours. Uh, but again, I wish, I wish deep down inside uh, that we really weren't needed uh, and the right people were doing the right thing uh, where, they, where they're supposed to. Um, the number two on here uh, is related to uh, a second chance. Again, a lot of vets, uh, all they're looking for is that next opportunity. Um, we never think about it from a second chance perspective because we do uh, what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, and we never think about, hey, if everything I had was taken away from me and, 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 and changed and I had to step into a new space, how would I deal with that second chance? If everything I had all of a sudden was, uh, was questionable, if I had a, a, a health scare, if I had a leg amputated and I needed to start from scratch, uh, what would I do with that second chance? So that's what I ask everybody today is to think about a second chance and what would I do with that second chance if I was given one. So again, during your time uh, at work today or whenever it might be, just take a step back and think, hey, how can I make a difference for these people in their second chance? And, and how would I react and how would I do something different uh, if I was given an opportunity like that, if, if all of a sudden everything I had was nearly taken away and I had to start from scratch. Uh, so that's a good way to look at these instances. Um, the second, again, I'll, I'll sequence these. So one was one, uh, there's two initiatives under number two and three under number three. Um, the second one for number two is uh, Operation Mulligan. Uh, it's an initiative for a, a senior NCO that I worked with in the Army. Uh, who we are trying to name in honor of uh, an, a, a program to uh, support vets, uh, to support vets in need with transition, with family issues, whatever those might be. So Operation Mulligan, he was an Irish, Irish lad. Uh, I thought Mulligan was an appropriate name. Uh, second chance in golf. Uh, I always wondered if uh, Mr. Mulligan was a good golfer or a bad golfer. Did he always need second chances? or was he just granting them to his friends who didn't play very well? Uh, I'm, a, I'm a golfer myself, so I always use the, the mulligans when I can. So this, this program, Operation Mulligan, again, is that second chance opportunity that I mentioned. It's, it's the ability to give someone something that they may need, whether it's a financial direction, uh, VA assistance, uh, a connection with that right um, program to help them get to the next step in their life. Um, one of the young soldiers that we're working with, with the Three Rangers program, is, a, is an amputee. And we're helping him with a business development concept uh, to start his own business to help fellow amputees with the new prosthetic technology. So this kid has taken an injury into a business opportunity, uh, a great, a great uh, role model in his fellow soldiers who, who he's building these new prosthetics for. Uh, so again, we, we talk about innovation here at Parari and, and Threat Tech, and these are great examples of people who step outside of their comfort zone, uh, some of it because of a, a debilitating injury, uh, but some because they feel that need uh, to fill a space that somebody else isn't filling. Um, number three, uh, there's three different things I'm gonna talk about uh, for number three. One is the Virginia Values Veterans Program. Uh, the V3 program. Has anybody, anybody heard about it? Uh, great program here in the state. Uh, there's about 600 companies uh, that are currently uh, V3 uh, companies. Threat Tech is in where we work here, is in the process of finishing up their V3 certification. That gives us access to the pool of veterans in Virginia as a uh, hiring candidates. Virginia is the seventh largest veteran population in the United States, so this is a big area for vets. And, and again, they bring a, a solid work ethic. Uh, they bring uh, that same team mentality that they had when they were on active duty. 
Um, I, I do want to bring up one point uh, about the veteran space and, and veterans in, in general. How, how many vets do we have here today? So, Alan, thanks for your service. Um, I, I went to a, a veteran conference a couple months ago, and, and there was a couple different topics that they talked about. And, and one was about um, how we, we have this culture of warriors and we're all battle hardened and, and everybody's out there uh, fighting this war for the last 15 years. And then later in the briefing, they talked about how we're trying to disconnect that war. You know, everybody doesn't have PTSD. We, 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 wanna, we wanna balance that message. And, and the one thing that I would say is that there, there are very few people who are on the front lines who are actually battle tested in, in, in firefights and, and, and doing that type of work. Uh, so there's an interesting dynamic there where we wanna sell veterans as battle tested and they're ready to walk into any organization because they've been through tough times. Uh, but then we wanna, on the other hand, say uh, the number of people who have PTSD and who have these battle tested, battle hardened problems is small. So we, we can't have both. We have to have one or the other. So we either wanna, we either wanna state that only a certain amount of people are, are warriors who are out on the front line in those day-to-day -day battles. Uh, again, I'm not minimizing the, the PTSD uh, impacts. Uh, that can happen to anybody in different locations. Uh, but we can't say the battle-hardened, battle-tested on a regular basis and then, and then try and minimize the, uh, the other uh, issues that come with it. Um, so uh, the next thing that I want to talk about is, uh, is the Three Rangers uh, program uh, that I'm involved with. Um, I have a bottle here today uh, and this is how it all started. Um, well, uh, I'll, I'll back up a little bit on that, but the, the bottle is a part of where we are today uh, because of a friend uh, named John Collette. Uh, John was a, an army ranger who, who we served together uh, in Mogadishu, Somalia. Um, John ended up getting out of the army due to a parachute accident. Um, and John wandered around a little bit when he got out of the service trying to figure out which way to go. So John is a great case study for what we're doing with the Three Rangers Foundation in, in mentoring, in helping veterans find that correct space in making them more productive in society once they get out. Uh, John got an opportunity to work uh, at a distillery outside of Chicago uh, and, and did very well. Again, he took those same work ethics that he had as an Army Ranger into a distillery and they saw these talents that he had and they made him uh, their master distiller and they said, uh, hey John, why don't you open your own product line? Uh, fill up a warehouse full of whiskey and, and you can name it whatever you want and do with it as you wish. So John got together with a few friends uh, and, and designed the Three Rangers concept. Um, again, we, we talk about innovation and, and doing things um, in that in that veteran space. Uh, again, the Three Rangers uh, logo is, is based on the, the Ranger diamond that you see in Saving Private Ryan and the, you know, that historical linkage that we have. So it's a great message, um, a great story behind it, and, and, and the initiative for uh, a former Ranger to start a, a whiskey company uh, that is tied to the Three Rangers Foundation. So when John and his two friends, the three rangers, got together, uh, they decided, hey, we want to use this whiskey uh, to found a foundation that helps veterans. So they decided, let's use the proceeds from the whiskey sales to, found, to fund the operating costs and the needs for Three Rangers Foundation. So again, a great concept. Here's guys, they were army rangers, they, they were serving, they were fighting, deploying around the world but they, they saw a space that they could go into, uh, a need uh, with, the, with the, uh, the veteran needs, um, and, the, and the wherewithal to, to make a, a premium whiskey uh, that um, supports uh, the cause that they really want to make a difference. Uh, again, John uh, wandered around a little bit when he got out of the Army. Uh, he saw some of those problems that, that veterans have, and, and, and he started this initiative uh, to help. Uh, so. In January of this year, uh, the, the Three Rangers team uh, asked me to be the executive director of the Three Rangers Foundation, and I immediately said yes. Um, again, I, I talked about this why before. 
and, and why we get involved with certain projects. Um, it was almost 23 years ago when we were in Somali together, and I, I learned from a band of brothers that if you get the right people around you, you can do just about anything. And, and this is a group of guys who I trust, who I've trusted my life with, uh, and now I trust with this organization to really make a difference. Um, after we came home, uh, again, back to this veteran space and, and how, we, how we do this and how we make a difference, uh, my, my brother spoke here a couple months ago. Um, I'm very proud of my, my, uh, my military family. Um, my brother was a surgeon up at Walter Reed in Washington, D.C. when all of our soldiers were evacuated back to the hospital. We had 23, 24 uh, wounded warriors up at Walter Reed on one ward um, getting treatment for different types of wounds uh, and I, I, I remember visiting uh, Walter Reed as a, as a young lieutenant and I was, I was up there and it was somewhat overwhelming. I, I stood in the hallway and all these guys with different wounds of different calibers and amputees and, and it was amazing what the surgeons were doing but I, I thought to myself how do these guys get taken care of if they leave the service as they're transitioning back to units? How are their families being taken care of when they come into Washington, D.C.? Where, where is the structure set up to support all this? And there was so many things going through my head. And now I have the ability to work for an organization that has answers to those questions, to, to help families when they go into areas that they're not used to. Uh, to help these soldiers as they transition uh, out of the military, uh, to, to use a mentor, uh, a, a young ranger who's leaving the service, who wants to continue to build on his mentorship capabilities. Uh, a lot of guys who leave the military uh, as veterans, uh, they feel somewhat of a void because they're not still connected in that, that military space. I, I just left a very highly functioning military team, and, and I don't have that anymore when I go back to my small community in southwest Kansas, for instance. Uh, but our organization gives them that opportunity to still mentor, to still reach out to veterans in need. They can plug into our organization as a mentor and, and get a small group of uh, soldiers who have like problems or like ideas or like wants uh, and, and it still fills that, that niche that they want to still be in uh, from their, their veteran connected space. Uh, so again, I, I, I love the challenge of, of staying connected in the veteran space. I feel that obligation, you know, not only because of the, the Ranger brothers and people I served with in uniform, um, but now having children in the military, I, I feel an even stronger desire uh, to make sure that one, they are taken care of, but two, our organization is able to have a voice to make sure that the leadership is doing the right thing, that the government's doing the right thing. We, we just don't want to help veterans on the back end. We want, we want to be proactive in, in talking to corporations on the qualities that veterans bring to your organization, uh, but we also want to, behind the scenes, uh, have veterans hired and, and let, they may not even know that they're a former veteran. Uh, this guy's just a quality individual who's coming into your space and here's the qualifications that he brings. Again, we're, we're not trying to create a separate niche of, of veterans. We're just trying to continue their very functional capabilities in a new space. Uh, I, I hear about some initiatives um, in different organizations where they have they have little veterans days and they have uh, little veterans communities. <laughs> we, we don't necessarily want to be a separate entity within an organization. We just want to be a part of uh, the team that you already have in place. Mm -hmm.